I want to speak with you uh, tonight not necessarily a sermon but a message that I believe is the key to personal revival in our life it's the renewing of the mind it's when your mind shifts when your mind changes they did a study and five millionaires and five homeless people and the people who had millions one or more millions of dollars they took the millions of dollars from them and they made them homeless and they gave these million of dollars to five homeless men now I wish I would have been part of that study but I wasn't they did a study for them where they watched their behavior and they found out that within a short period of time the men who were millionaires who were taking their money from them and were given a requirement that they cannot go back to their old business or their old contacts they bounced back and within few years they got the millions of dollars again and got a business going different business they did a study with the homeless man and they found out that within a short period of time the homeless man returned back to homelessness and some were actually on a suicide watch because they were trying to kill themselves and the study came to this conclusion a millionaire is a state of mind not a state of finances and homelessness begins as a place where you don't have money but after a while it becomes part of a stronghold and becomes a mindset that even if you're given money even if you're given connections even if you're given welfare it doesn't change your life it's a band-aid because the real problem is in your mind no wonder apostle paul who was alive 2000 years ago before this study said in romans chapter 12 verse 2 is that our life is transformed but when our mind is renewed most of us will live the opposite we believe that when our life changes our mind will change we actually blame our circumstances people our upbringing and our parents our physical appearance our lack of gifts and abilities and the state of our emotional being and God says everything is the opposite everything is the other way around the reason why I want to speak with you about this today is because this has been the miracle of my life during the birth there was an optical nerve that was damaged in my brain and when I grew up eventually I developed chronic insecurity and I shared this testimony a thousand times and if you will hear me preach I'll share it two thousand times more in my life why because it's my testimony when we moved to the United States at the age of 13 December 6 1999 I started to become aware as a teenager of my surroundings of my appearance and of the fact that I was very limited with everything I started to become aware of my appearance I started to become aware of the fact that I couldn't connect with people I was socially awkward I couldn't communicate at the church at the time they had three three positions two were really good for the guys third one was mainly for the girls worship singing and doing poems poems was for the girls I applied the two and both of them I wasn't good at I was not brave enough to apply for the poems and things were very challenging for me and 17 18 years ago I was on the edge I know committing suicide would be wrong but I was praying secretly and wishing that I would be dead I was hoping for an accident in which I will be dead because I felt like the world would be a better place with me not in it and then I realized that if God could do a miracle all this junk I feel inside and the fact that I'm skipping school because I'm, I'm embarrassed to stand in front of a group of 15 students or 20 students if God could only change my physical eyes if God can only change people around me and make them be more accepting of me then my world on the inside will change so I started to study about demonology, I started to study about healing and receive prayer not because I had problem with my eyes but because I have problem with my heart I had two eye surgeries one in the Ukraine one in the United States nine of them really helped and they were not supposed to help my vision I have a clear vision out of four siblings and both parents the only one without glasses so I have a, no problem with the vision but I wanted to change my appearance thinking that my appearance will change my inner image my inner feeling my mindset and how I felt about myself but something else happened the miracle that really the big miracle that happened that is uh, is actually more difficult for God to do than creating new eyes for someone a miracle that's more challenging than casting out six demons out of a man is this miracle 
it's when God can take a stronghold built over 15 20 years and take in two three years and begin to brick by brick layer by layer thought by thought attitude by attitude confession by confession a mindset by a mindset and God begins to break it down and realign it to his word well you look in the mirror and you don't see a skin stretched over a skeleton you see someone who God says who you are even though you don't feel nothing like that on the inside even though your circumstances do not bear evidence to who you are what God says in his word but you still stand on it that my friend is a miracle and when God does that miracle that miracle changes your life I genuinely believe deep in my heart and from my experience and many men of God will experience that as well here is that the renewing of your mind brings revival in your life. Can somebody say amen? amen. Prayer, fasting, extravagant giving is not done by people who are just radical. One thing about these people is they think different. They don't see the same problem the same way you see. They don't see money the same way you see. They don't see their morning hours the same way you see. They don't see fasting the same way you see. You see, there's something about them. They are thinking on a different level. That's why they live on a different level. And that's why God responds to them on a different level. Can somebody say amen? You know, spiritual warfare, the beginning of the spiritual warfare is the renewing of the mind. When, when Moses came to God, and God gave him a calling in the desert and God gave him an assignment and says I want you to go deliver Israel out of Egypt and if you read in Exodus and um, and if they're behind me you guys can throw the the graphic and just kind of follow with the notes I'm not going to be pointing to it so just just kind of follow with me and stuff if you see the spiritual uh post the quote about the spiritual warfare begins with the renewing of the mind and so just let's just stay consistent with it gracias senorita Okay, in Exodus chapter 7 when Moses comes to Egypt and he does what God calls him to do. Shows up to Pharaoh, says, Pharaoh let my people go. First of all he tells people of Israel, he says, hey by the way I'm here to help you all out. I'm gonna get you out. God did some miracles. Let me show you. Brings it. It becomes white and there was, this wasn't some magic he read on YouTube. This was like legit. He throws a snake, the snake, uh, the rod, uh, rod turns into a snake, does few little kind of miracles and people are like yes this is great God visited his people awesome people start packing we're going Moses is like well hold on just need to talk to Pharaoh just need to get him to sign off on this and we're good he goes to Pharaoh he's thinking well people of God believe in me now I mean I'm just gonna go to Pharaoh Pharaoh's gonna sign off on this and everything's good and we're ready to go he goes into Pharaoh and Pharaoh says are you high what are you thinking he said, dude, we have your poster in here in the court. You're the most wanted man. He says, oh, I'm glad you're back. We're going to punish you. Are you crazy? He's like, what are you thinking? What are you smoking, Moses? Get out of here. He kicked him out. The Bible says he didn't even take him serious. And not only that, he writes, a, writes not a slip letting them go. He says, well, since these guys have time to dream, let's kill that from them. Let's remove the straw and make him make bricks without straw. Let them look for straw. That means they're going to have to work twice as hard now for the same slavery they were in. So Moses comes back. Israel think he's trying to kill him. Moses think he's a joke and Moses is frustrated to God because God is not doing anything that he promised to do. And Exodus chapter 7 begins like this. God in the midst of this comes to Moses. You would think God would say, hey Mo, um, hang in there tight I'm working on it hey Moses can we um I'm, I'm so sorry man I, I kind of was busy with the other stuff going on right now in the world really forgot that you were going to Pharaoh to kind of prepare the way for you um I'm really sorry that the people are not wanting you to deliver them no more man I, I didn't see that coming that's kind of quick you kind of <laughs> kind of accelerated the whole situation that, that's kind of quick Moses God ignores the whole thing that Moses is throwing in the towel, doesn't want to do anything. You know what God does in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1? He comes to Moses. He says, Moses, almost like God doesn't even see all of that. He says, I make you God to Pharaoh. Excuse me? You make me what? He says, the problem with you Moses, when you go to Pharaoh, you're still going there as a slave. I'm making you a God to Pharaoh. He says the problem is not with Pharaoh, it's you. You stink like a slave. 
you think like a slave you behave like a slave he says when you walk next time to the pharaoh's court you're not a slave begging you're a god commanding now don't let the word a god mess you up for egyptians since pharaoh was considered Ra, the god it was natural for for moses to understand when he walks to the court of a pharaoh he's not begging he's not pleading he's not asking and he's not requesting and next time moses walked in same tone same words everything was the same except something shifted within moses because pharaoh was begging he was asking please ask your god to stop the frogs and every plague that came on Egypt started to directly attack God of Egypt. Why? Because gods went to war. Spiritual warfare begins not when God changes your situation. When God changes your mindset about your situation and the new you walks into the same situation and the situation does not know what to do with itself. The foundation of spiritual warfare is the renewed mind. Can somebody say amen? Many times we say, well, if God can only do more miracles, then my mind will change. I want to tell you something. God did not do more miracles until he shifted the mindset of Moses. Because yes, Moses was out of Egypt, but still there were still remains of Egypt inside of Moses. And when God pulled all of that out and he walked into Egypt, a different man next time. Pharaoh begged. Pharaoh asked. Pharaoh pleaded and then Moses got out. He led the people out. The way you came into this world was head first. The way you come out of every womb, every limitation, every stagnation, every problem including sickness and poverty permanently is head first. If God pulls your finances out of the problem but your head is still in that problem, your miracle will not last very long you will still go back to the same poverty within two, three years. If God pulls your health out of cancer, but He doesn't pull your mind out of cancer, that even if you don't have cancer, but you still expect it, you still fear it, you still look small little pain and you're like, okay, I hope I didn't get it. If you still have your head stuck in there, listen, your healing cannot be permanent because your healing has to happen here as well as in your physical body. And somebody say amen. And somebody say amen. Touch your neighbors that come out head first. Your body will follow. Your health will follow. Your life will follow. Can somebody say amen? If you have your Bible, let's open to the famous scripture about spiritual warfare. I want to title this message from, from professing to possessing. Many of us have a lot of things we have promised to us by God many things we profess that belong to us but professing is good possessing is better can somebody say amen I profess that I am blessed but to possess the blessing is a little bit better can somebody say amen you can profess that you're healed but when you possess the healing it's a lot better you can profess that you're anointed but when you begin to walk in that anointing, it's a lot better. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and verse 12, it says the following, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Precious Holy Spirit, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we're gathered today under the umbrella of the name of Jesus and I pray right now that you will as we dissect as we dive into your word I ask you please let your word dive into us in Jesus name Amen Amen Ephesians chapter 6 is like the masterpiece of Apostle Paul about the topic of the spiritual world and I want to just draw a few little nuggets that have become the cornerstone of my understanding, the framework of my reaction toward the spiritual world and I pray that it will be also a blessing to you as well. The first thing that I want you to notice in Ephesians chapter 6 is in the warfare verses, 
Paul never once mentions warfare as a way for spiritual victory. He never once mentions from chapter 11, chapter, verse, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11, all the way down. He never once mentioned to put on the armor and do all of these things so that you can get a victory. Paul lives with the idea that we do spiritual warfare not for victory but from victory. That's why he says put on the armor, fight and do all of this to stand, withstand, stand, stand, withstand, stand, never to win because you already won. The foundation of our battle against the forces of darkness does not start with us winning does not start with us so we fight to win but we already won in Jesus Christ and from that position we fight. Can somebody say amen? amen. Write this down. We fight from victory not for victory. The victory has already been won on the cross and our battle against the forces of darkness even if those devils even if those attacks happen in your body or it happened in your mind or it happens in your sleep or it happens in your family or it happens on your purity or it happens on the other areas of your life you have to understand no matter how deep satan got you he's already been brain damaged on the cross my bible makes me to understand that on the calvary Jesus gave Satan a brain damage, permanent one. There is no healing for it, there is no cure for it, there is no doctor that can help him to recover his brains back. He crushed his skull. That's why devil is crazy. That's why devil can't repent. That's why devil can't be fixed. Why? He's been permanently damaged in his head. He can think straight. He does everything wrong because on the Calvary and he can't win against you without your permission because on the Calvary Jesus gave him a defeat. His defeat is my victory. Which means that no matter what situation I find myself in today, no matter how I feel right now, no matter what the doctor's report says, no matter how many times I've fallen and I promise to myself I'll never do that sin again and I found myself entrapped, pulled back, I take two steps backwards and three steps backwards, I, I, I see myself trying fasting and praying and everything and I, it seems like I can never win. You will never win until you first realize you already won. You will say, well, that's, that, that's, that's great. Before you possess it, you got to profess it. You got to position yourself in that victory. Now that victory on the cross doesn't automatically make you a winner. It gives you a potential for the victory. It means it empowers you now to fight. Some people say, well, if Jesus already did everything on the cross, then I don't need to fight. Actually, because he did it on the cross, you need to fight. When Goliath fell, Israel didn't go home. When Goliath fell, Israel went to war. Because Goliath, when he stood, Israel was hiding, shrinking and running. But when David came and he hit his head, remember? His head and Goliath falls, Israel says, well, I mean, we can do this. I think we got this. I think they're running. See, when Jesus came, he is our son of David. He hit the devil right in his head. And Goliath has fallen. It's not so that you can stand and say, well, I guess blessings will come to me. No, 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 no. In the promised land, you don't wait for the blessing to come to you. You go after them. You go and you fight. Can somebody say amen? amen. When Jesus came on this earth, until about a thousand years, Christianity, three, four hundred years predominantly, but almost to a thousand years, Christianity embraced a warfare mentality. Meaning, our fight is against sickness, our fight is against demons, our fight is against curses and the evil in this world. This mentality empowered Christians to fight. It gave them a framework by which to explain the evil in this world. Because the way they explained the evil was this, we are in the war, Satan is a terrorist, he attacks people, and people are casualty of that war. Saint Augustine came. Other theologians came for which we are eternally indebted to. How God used them to impact Christian world. But they also did a damage to Christianity. Which damage? They introduced 
a mindset called blueprint where there is overemphasis on God's sovereignty and it fails to empower Christians to fight makes them confused whether this is God trying to do something it gives them no good explanation of why the evil happens because everything is about God doing something when in reality so much of the evil is the enemy doing stuff and we're empowered to fight versus many Christians today have adopted the blueprint mentality meaning you don't do anything God is the one that's in charge God is in control and you just kind of wait for things to fall where they do in the beginning of Christian faith in book of Acts and Jesus that was not the mentality Christians had Jesus said this since the day of John the Baptist till now kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent don't wait for God to sort things out they go at it they attack and they fight if you want to see miracles in your life you have to put the blueprint mentality in the glove box of your theology and you have to develop the mentality of a warrior not a wimp you have to develop a mentality of a fighter you have to believe in one thing God is good devil is bad period every good gift comes from the Father everything else God had nothing to do with it you and I were empowered to stand against it Holy Spirit is on our side we're gonna win with him we're gonna overcome with him we're gonna see the supernatural we're gonna see the miracles and where we don't see it we stand more in faith and say God we want to see your glory move we see things black and white amen I know some of you um, maybe just got a little bit scared he said, how do you explain this and don't, I don't explain it, you do. We fight. You can do the explaining, we do the fighting. Because we need to win. We need to bring an answer to a dying generation. And we need to squash the devil like a bug. We need to stand against the forces of darkness and get them out of our families, get them out of our cities and get them out of people's lives. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> Casey young lady named Ken Casey she came in April to our conference and I did not know this young lady until during the deliverance an evil spirit came out of her a spirit of Baal it's a thousand year old demon that's been in the mentioned in the Bible as an idol and what we found out later she emailed us a month or so later and told us that she was diagnosed with bipolar she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and that at a very young age, her parents who were involved deeply in the occult, she's from Salem and she's an American lady. Her parents were involved deeply in the occult, introduced her to the occult. And because of that, there has been a permanent damage because of demonic forces, even on her brain, on her soul and on her emotions. And so after she was delivered, after the war was done, we didn't just kind of wait and see what, what, you know, God is in control, He's doing, but we knew that this was bad, God is good, and we got to get the bad out. And when we stood there, when the power of God manifested, and all the stuff that was not from God was removed, this young lady, who was dedicated to the devil at the young age, whose parents are still occultic, who was schizophrenic, who was bipolar, and her own doctor said, she was on 15 type of medicine and she had the highest dose of anyone in America. That's what her doctor said. After the deliverance, she came to her doctor because we don't never advise people to stop medicine cold turkey without consulting their doctor, especially when the medicine has to do with antidepressants. She goes to her doctor and she says, doctor, I feel like I don't have these problems no more. I don't have schizophrenia. I don't have bipolar. I don't hear voices no more. I want to stop the medicine. And the doctor says, it will take you two years to stop the medicine if you don't have the problem. If you have the problem, you can't stop it. But if you don't have the problem, two years minimum. And she says, can we start stopping the, 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 the pills? Because you can't just stop them cold turkey. A doctor says, let's do it. And within two weeks, she walks off of her pills. Till this day, this lady has a clean bill of health where schizophrenia, bipolar, and 15 high dose medic medications were completely stopped. devil hates people he wants to ruin people he wants to with his dirty claws he gets into people's soul 
He makes them victims. God passionately loves people. People are good. You get the bed out, they're beautiful. They're godly. This young lady today goes to home group, memorizes scripture. I remember we were at Galasinski Church on their 20th anniversary. I look back and I see she drove from Salem. She sat on the second pew wearing Hungry Gen logo. She just visited us a few months ago again. And seeing her, I would have never said that this is the lady that had all of these problems and all of these demons and all of this les lesbianism that she had on the top of that. And I would have never thought that. But see, when the evil is removed, the good flourishes. Can somebody say amen? But we fight from position of victory on the cross. Not to get it, but because we have it already in Jesus and from that position we fight. Can somebody say amen? I want you to write down point number two. Protect God's anointing by avoiding battles of the flesh. It's interesting that the moment Apostle Paul begins to talk about spiritual warfare, he says, be strong in God, in the power of God's might. And verse, verse 12, Apostle Paul right away starts to mention the importance of, he says, make sure you know, you don't fight against flesh and blood. Meaning, if you want to be successful in withstanding, standing in the victory in Christ, it's only dependent on your ability to stay away from arguing with people. When you believe in what God did on the cross for you, this is you. The anointing is already in you to fight the enemy. The anointing is already in you to break the chains. Many of us, we protect that anointing by staying away from sin and that's good. But that's not where the anointing leaks. The anointing for victory is not leaking through your sin. There is a particular sin that that anointing leaks through. It's called arguing with people. It's called fighting a physical battle with people. Before David could fight Goliath, he came and he asked the brothers around, what's going on? Who is this Goliath guy? And the brother said, oh, he, he's a bad dude. He, he, he's a really bad dude. And, Goliath, and David is like, uh, I'm going to go fight him. And then the battle shifts. The brothers of David, the brothers of David look at David and says that, uh, who you think you are? We know your motives. It's crazy when people start knowing, they don't even know their own motives and they already know yours. The prophetic comes on them right away. They're like, we know you have a stupid heart. You came here to see the battle. We, we know the reason. You're just trying to grow your Instagram account, your YouTube channel. That, that's all you're here for. And we, we know why you're here. David, get out of here. And they start picking up a fight with David. I love this about David because if I would have been David, I wouldn't act like that. David walked away. Did you know that David had enough ammunition to put him in their place? Because if I would have been David, I say, yo, I'm embarrassed to be your brother. You call yourself soldier, soldiers? You bunch of weaklings. Why is the Goliath still standing if you're a soldier? Why are you picking fight with me, you loser? You go finish him. If I would be David, I would give him a little bit of scriptural references why he's not fighting. Because David had ammunition. David had enough to, to put him in their place. But the Bible says David walked away. That is the secret. If you ever want to get to your Goliath with the anointing, you're going to have to not pick a fight with your brothers when you have enough ammunition to put them in their place. Some people are not worth responding to. Some comments are not worth replying to on Instagram and on Facebook. Some people are not worth putting in their place. They're not there to learn. They're there to leak your anointing. That's all. I know you can beat the skunk any time of the day. You need to ask yourself a question. Is the smell worth the fight? <laughs> See, this is you. Sometimes, this is somebody on Instagram, somebody on Facebook, and then a lot of you, you have some people at home, or you also have, you got an argument with a pastor. <laughs> but your pastor's really good, so he doesn't let you. <laughs> and the interesting is that you're not smoking weed, you're not committing immor immorality, 
but you're thinking about it, you're rehearsing, you're fighting them back. And you may say, well, it's not a big deal, Vlad. It's not as bad as doing something bad. It's clean water, so it'll dry up. And so it's not anything bad, but this is what happens. And by the time you get the Goliath, by the time you get the Goliath, this is what happens. You realize, um, and this is what typically people say, I feel so drained. I feel, I feel so empty. Hmm, no wonder why. Submit to your pastor instead of try to change him. Honor the God, the people God places under you instead of try to control them. I'm gonna tell you one thing. If you watch your heart from getting involved in battles which God did not anoint you to win, you will always keep your anointing. You will always keep your anointing. This is what this anointing is for. Is to use it to win battles. But before you fight your Goliath, Satan will present a brother and a sister, watch this, who are not fighting their own Goliath, but because they were created to fight, they need to fight something, so they'll fight you. Because they lost their own anointing to fight the real enemy, they need to fight something. And unfortunately, you still got yours, so they'll fight you. They'll argue with you, they'll pick on you, they'll belittle you, they'll humiliate you, they'll poke on you, they'll provoke you, they'll touch your nerve, they'll do whatever they can. But remember this, this is a strategy of the devil. Because verse 11 says this, if you want to succeed against the spiritual forces in your life, you have to avoid at all costs arguing and fighting and picking fights with people. Can somebody say amen? Some of you today, I just gave you a secret of why you're spiritually depleted. It's not because you're not praying enough. It's because you're fighting wrong battles. You need to unplug. There are people who will poke on you and send you a text message. I remember one time I had a young man. He's no longer here. Uh, he's no longer alive. And, and he, was, he, he said something very, very mean and very hurtful. He sent something to me and he was a recovering a drug addict. And, and it was very mean. I still remember the feelings. I don't remember what he said, but I remember the feelings, what he said. And I typed him. At the time, you know, we didn't have I iPhones. So we, did, we had these messages where they came in like in paragraphs. And I remember I typed to him three paragraphs. I went back, I revised it, added a scripture to it. I had enough ammunition there and, and uh, grenades in those three text messages. I would have exploded his whole salvation and security in God. It was so loaded. And I looked at that and I remember the Spirit of the Lord put on my heart and he said, Vlad, you're about to punch a skunk. He said, do you want the smell? And I said, but I need to prove I'm right. He says, you don't need to prove anything to anyone. He says, you need to protect right now my anointing. Within one hour, he sends me three messages apologizing and repenting. And I looked back and I was like, I'm so glad I didn't leak. Don't leak for your enemies. You got that anointing, don't lose it for them. They're never gonna change. Some people will hate you no matter what you do. Some people are haters because they're haters. It has nothing to do with you. The, their problem is they have a loss in their own life. The problem is they're ignoring their own Goliath. And so it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your character. It has nothing to do with your methods. It has to do with one thing. They're not winning in their own life and they're trying to, it's kind of like a mosquito. It lives off of your blood. That's all. And you got to let him go. And you got to protect your anointing. Because that anointing is what God gave you. And some of you, you can stand against your enemy. You can whip by your enemy for one reason. You made enemy out of your spouse. You made enemy out of your children. You made enemy out of your parents. You made enemy out of people. And you're fighting a battle. God never called you to fight. You're fighting a battle. God never anointed you to fight. And you're leaking every single time. You're coming back. God replenishes you. But you're wasting it at the battles you were never supposed to be in in the first place. Have the power. Have self-control. Have the grace. Have the boldness to say no. To be like Jesus. He was silent before his accusers. Did he have something to say? He knew their dirtiest secrets. He knew every skeleton in their mind. He knew every thought they thought. He knew where they're gonna burn. He knew how they're gonna die. He knew everything about them. He could have write them a three book novel about their thoughts and their motives. He said nothing. That's why 
he was raised from the dead. That's why he could utter a few words and shake dead men. Because he knew how not to say some words in front of religious men. Can somebody say amen? I want you to write down point number three. Mark, if you can come up. Armor of God does not protect me from an evil day, but it protects me from becoming evil person. Put a hand on. Armor of God doesn't protect me from an evil day. I want you to see this in Ephesians chapter 6. It says the following that God says, put on the armor of God so you can stand in the evil day. I cannot tell you how encouraging I find that the fact Paul did not say that you can stand in evil days. For me, it's a prophetic word. This day can only last 24 hours. Have you had those days? What it's like before you got up, it started to go bad. Even when you got up, like you stepped on something sharp. <laughs> and then you got to your phone and you find out something bad already happened. You got to work and the rock from the truck hit your brand new car you got from a dealer right in the middle of the windshield. And then you find out that, you know, people have followed you on Twitter or Instagram. <laughs> okay, that's not a bad day. That's maybe a good thing. And it's just one thing goes after another. One thing goes after another. The things that were supposed to go good, things that go bad. And sometimes you just feel it where the bottom is falling. It's just like it keeps going, 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 going. To me, when I see that, when I feel that, I always tell myself this, it's an evil day, it's going to end within 24 hours. It has no authority to become days, weeks, or months. And for that to happen, I need to have an armor, meaning I have to think different. And I have to not allow my feelings and what I see to affect now how I think. I need to understand this too shall pass. It's not because I have a demon. It's not because I have a curse. It's not because there's some open door in my life. It's because I'm a Christian and Bible says the evil day, not day. Some of you have allowed that to become days, weeks, months, decades, years. And now the devil has not just made an evil day. He's turned you into evil person. His goal is to use your struggle to make it into a stronghold. Take your issue and turn it into your identity. All of that is just a method. And the scripture tells us that we have to put on the armor of God so that when stuff like that happens, you don't stop the evil day. You just make it end in 24 hours. That the next morning, new mercies come. Next morning, as the night before, the day before things were bad, and next morning you begin to see miracles, you begin to see great things. Like, man, this is a great day to be alive. Why? Because good mercies are coming. Because the evil day didn't turn into an evil week, evil life, evil month, and didn't make you into an evil, bad person. Now, the armor of God. I had this revelation that has become a source of encouragement for me. The armor of God is not something you produce. It's something that you receive from God. It's already yours. And your and my job is not to make it, but to wear it. Amen? Amen. This is the problem that we have as Christians. Is that many of us have the armor of God. Now, this is definitely not Roman armor. But you definitely understand what this means. Because if I will put on the actual armor, most of you will not connect the dots. But when you see this, the armor of God is... For many of us, it hangs in our theological closet. I'm going to show you how. I am righteous in Jesus. Oh, alleluia. Praise be to God. The truth, the word of God... Oh, amen. I got like three Bibles on every app. I got, I got it. Yeah. This is the word of God, the rhema word, means revelations. Oh yeah, I got so many prophetic words, man. It's just incredible. Like even this week, Andre prophesied. This was great. I mean, I, I got prophecies. The, the salvation, man, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. When I die, I'm going to heaven. The, the peace, man, I got the peace of God. It, it, everything is great. The only problem is that these things are pretty much useless if they are in your closet. 
they are useless if they are into your theological closet meaning if you know that you they exist but you're not living conscious of them right and so if we could put on the the righteousness go ahead just slip it up like this. the righteousness yes put on the head on okay now this is bible says breastplate of righteousness see there's a difference between having it and wearing it many christians they have the righteousness meaning jesus made them righteous not just forgave them their sins he gave righteousness but this is what happens is that you don't live your life with the awareness that as though you've never sinned before you're like a russian car from auction looks good on the outside there's only one problem on a title it has this word called savage <laughs> rebuilt yes it's a mercedes yes it has a nice exhaust pipe yes it's an audi yes it has good rims oh yes it looks great on the pictures there's only one problem you can sell it for high for one reason it's because it's been rebuilt nobody tells you nobody will figure it out but you know that in the glove box of your car there is a damage in the title and many of you that's a, that's how you live you have this take this off you have this on the cross Jesus made you righteous but you still carry here because you lost your virginity because you've done drugs because you've done some things anything that the enemy people say it hurts straight through you why because the righteousness you have is in theological closet of the calvary my bible says those who are in christ are new creation not rebuilt title you're not second best that's why god says put on the righteousness don't just have it wear it think it through like that then you will not settle for any loser why because your value goes up when you know you're righteous see many girls they settle for anything or anyone why because they feel like well i've been damaged well i've sinned listen god did not put salvage title on your title you did devil did put on a righteousness as though you've never sinned before when your day is the worst when you're going through an evil day put on the helmet so put on the righteousness again bro sorry i took it down and the righteousness of jesus is bulletproof it protects your heart amen and then most of us the problem is we wear the hat of condemnation instead of the helmet of salvation <laughs> Jesus that rhymes amen so put on the helmet of salvation bro take off that condemnation I really hope it's gonna fit in sometimes you just gotta the head you gotta squeeze that so good all right all right well what does salvation does salvation always protects your head <laughs> honestly the devil the devil he's gonna break this he won't break you a lot of us have head problems and head traumas for one reason because we're wearing hats instead of helmets oh we have the helmet <laughs> we even know the scripture where it's located we can quote it to you because we had to memorize it before we got baptized in the church so we got it hanging actually a few different colors and different sizes in the closet of our theological preferences god is not asking you do you have it in your closet god says do you have it on your head what really helps in a spiritual battle what really protects you and devil can go like this and he can beat it and you're like devil the more you beat it the more broken you get i'm gonna still be here why because i am saved because i know who i am and i wear it can somebody say amen are you good it doesn't hurt are you sure whose whose helmet is it i'm sorry if it breaks but according to the bible it shouldn't break <laughs> so you see this is not damaging him now does he feel the hit no he hears the hit of course it just doesn't do anything the devil will come he will do this and after about 24 hours he gets tired 
That's why the Bible says it becomes only evil day <laughs> because I mean how many bullets can you shoot and after that look we can remove this and try without it see <laughs> see how he takes it I, I don't want to do that because we already do that regularly in personal, personal lives <laughs> so we have the testimony to prove that it hurts for it not to hurt I want to tell you something is that live with the consciousness I am righteous I am saved now my mind is not doing good right now yeah the car has a flat tire my wife is angry at me I know that the dog had pooped at the wrong place and, and and ate the the part of the stair that I already repaired two weeks ago yeah I understand the check bounce I understand this got removed that got removed I, I understand I didn't get approved for the college I understand but I am righteous I am saved I have the peace peace of God and I have the shield of faith I have these things the devil can never take them from me I can lose everything but I can never lose that it's interesting none of the armor of God is your health or your finances finances. None of the armor of God is your spouse or your boyfriend. None of the armor of God is your followers on Instagram. None of the armor of God is your degree. None of the armor of God is your ability to communicate. None of the armor of God is your ministry. Everything about the armor of God is something Satan can touch. When he touches something he can touch, hang on to something he can never touch. And say, devil, you can take this, this, this. You can take anything, but there's one thing you can't take. I'm a saved person. I'm going to heaven, you're going to hell, I'm a righteous person, you're a messed up devil, you suffer brain damage and I am protected in everybody. Ha, ha. And you stand your ground. Can somebody say amen? So put, put on the, right, like this, like this. Mm -hmm. Or flip, flip it over. We all have the armor of God given to us by God we just have to wear it we just have to wear it and when we wear it God begins to protect us God begins to change us the existence of God's Word doesn't change you it's when you apply that when you live in the consciousness of that it changes you I know some of you may say well that's a cliche I heard this I even said this to other people it changes your life when my beautiful wife Baby, can I have you for a second? Yeah. When my beautiful wife, when I married her, and um, within a very short period of time, during our marriage, she started to experience very, very, very bad nightmares. And I'm not talking about nightmares where somebody is chasing you um, and something bad happens once in a while. I'm talking about nightmares where they repeat it almost every two, three days. Sometimes, I, and I sleep so good, like you can't wake me I mean I have a gift one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit of my life is sleeping I can sleep really good <laughs> everywhere and anywhere and so you can't wake me up at night the dog the dog barks at night don't hear him nothing but I would wake up from my wife screaming or crying in her sleep and wake her up because I would see she's tormented I remember sometimes I saw devil hurt people I saw how he hurt my wife she started to have a problem connecting with people at church. It wasn't like, oh, it's a new area. She doesn't know the ministry. It wasn't like that. It was so severe that not once and not twice she was saying that I'm leaving back home. I can't take this anymore. She, she would during prayer just stand there and not be able to pray. Like something controlled her. Everything was so, she was like the, the, the social bunny. She's, before we got married, we get married and she just almost like can't function spiritually and it started to affect me so deeply and so powerfully and I started to realize it's a spiritual problem something that her parents her mom and her grandma and, and others were facing so I thought by fixing it so she has a sister who is her best friend so her sister would come and visit our town I tried to hook her up her sister with one of the boys at the church thinking if she gets married you know my sister her, her sister will have a companion she will have friendship and her sister Little didn't like did not like the Tri Cities, didn't like none of the boys in the church, and all the blind dates never worked. I tried different things. We even went for deliverance in Africa. We went for deliverance in the Ukraine. I had one of the most powerful men in the world pray for us and pray for her. And they even said words like, You're free, everything is good. We came home, everything was the same. You know what my wife started to do? 
she worked the post office where she was delivering mail so it allowed her to listen to messages every single day she would listen from four to six hours a day messages on the holy spirit what it did is started to wash her mind to that degree see the word of god is something everybody has but it's different not when you have it when it washes you like soap it cleanses you and after a while the nightmares subsided she, they were still there but I would see her wake up in the morning you know and I would say you know how did she sleep and she would have a different attitude she approached it like a warrior instead of a victim it wasn't over one night I started to see my wife in front of my own eyes change on her own she started to lead a small group with teenage girls picking them up on Sunday night and she started to lead her home group which quickly multiplied into four she started to blossom in the church she started to her her even finances in her own life started to grow her own sister got married to my brother uh-huh talk about miracles and nightmares they stopped but the crazy part is the person that got developed through the process of putting on the armor of God still remained and today the very process she uses it in other areas of her life to achieve victory amen baby you want to say something about that oh yeah it was a process for me when i was literally brainwashing myself with the sermons about the holy spirit sometimes i would re-listen one sermon tens and twenty times and I would experience the presence of the Holy Spirit at that moment and it would make me so strong that I was able to fight in prayer for myself and so with time I've noticed that things started to change and and then it just like literally like I was a brand new person I was able to fight for my happiness for the relationship with the Holy Spirit and things like that and right now I can like literally say that the Holy Spirit completely delivered me and I became like myself like a new person thank you hold on, hold on. the Bible says you will know the truth and what the Bible doesn't say you will get the truth the truth is like soap you can have a truckload of it in your garage and you can stink like a skunk because the presence of the truth doesn't change you it's applying of the truth that changes you for those of you who paint houses you know one thing you can have a bucket of paint but the color of your walls will never change until you remove that paint from the bucket and put it on the wall you got to take the bible from the bible and put it in your mind Advil doesn't work in a bottle. Advil only works in your mouth. Same thing with this armor. As long as it's in the cross, it doesn't do no good to you. It has to be in you. The armor has to be wearing you. You have to wear it, not just have it. Not just have the existence of it, but apply it. Meaning consciously and confessionally. That means consciously I think through the process of what God has that Satan can never touch. And secondly, I regularly confess it when I'm doubting that I have it. I regularly confess it when I doubted that I have it. Amen. Let's give my wife a round of applause. Thank you. And lastly, and lastly, and we're going to come to prayer. I want you to put up the last point, point number four, and, and that is the strategy for advancement is the sword of the Holy Spirit. If Mariana, if you guys could come up. The strategy for advancement is the sword of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you kind of gave all of my secrets out up front sounds great so if, you, if we can see your belt maybe kind of loosen it just a little bit the bible says that the belt of truth we have to have the belt of truth i just want to see okay good so uh, st still put it on and just kind of tight it tight it because you want the truth always to be tight because some people have loose convictions and it's not good but your convictions always have to be tight yeah but not too tight because then you become a little bit legalistic so the truth the truth is the general word of God the general revelation of God's word the word of God the Bible says the sword of the spirit is the rhema the rhema is the specific word just one second the rhema is the specific word I want you to see this that hangs on the general word meaning every revelation you get from God better hang on the belt of God's truth because otherwise you're coming up with heresy 
Amen. If the Spirit tells you to sell dope to sponsor the kingdom of God, it ain't the Holy Ghost. It's some other spirit because it cannot hang on the belt of truth. God's revelation has to hang on God's information of God's word. These two, they're connected. The belt is the center of our life, the general word of God. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we don't lose our streaks in the version Bible. Amen. Okay, some of you lost your streaks. Some of you are not reading the Bible on the version. But we, we hold the general word of God. We constantly read it. We constantly memorize it. And then the Holy Spirit from that word, on occasion, He brings a revelation. He brings a specific insight that becomes so alive that the Bible calls it the sword of the Spirit. The historians and the, and the people who studied these verses, they said that this sword was actually a very small, short, range sword it wasn't a long sword it wasn't something that you used in the long distance it was something that for a short combat the sword of the spirit is a dagger it's a revelation God gives you that in the middle of an evil day spiritual warfare when hell breaks loose God wants you to have it in handy what is this it's a prophetic word God gave over your life it's a dream you had when you were 16 of who and what God is going to use you for. It's a prophecy that you got when you were 12. Somebody came up to you and gave you a prophetic word. This is sharp. It's directly given to you, tailored to your situation. It hangs on the general word of God, meaning it lines up with the word of God. And this is so important because during when hell breaks loose, when things are difficult, why this comes in handy? I'm going to share something that is so powerful. This is the only thing that will help you to advance during the worst days of your life is God's revelation, God's prophetic word, God's dream. Somebody's prophecy toward you. When you pull it out, when you can feel God, it's called the sword of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit in my worst day hides in this. He can't be hidden in my feelings because I can't find Him there. I find Him in the prophetic word. I find him in the dream that he has given to me when I was very young. I find him in his sword, not in my feelings. When the day is evil, I stop looking for God in my emotion. I look for God in his promises directly tailored to my life. I'm going to show you how I do it. At a very young age, we were in Seattle. My pastor took us here. I was preaching at one Pentecostal church here and uh, I was doing the last message. At the end of the message, a lady came, an older lady. She sneaked through us, it was a larger church, grabbed me, pulled me to the side. I think I was about 14 or 15 years of age. She grabbed me by a hand, feisty, strong lady. She said, we were praying and during the prayer, she said, I saw a vision. She says, I saw out of your mouth, a trumpet in your, inside of your mouth. And she says, young man, I saw fire coming out. She said, don't be afraid. You will prophesy. And she just, just no buy, no amen, nothing. Just said it and walked off. And I, I was like, I think the prophet spoke to me. <laughs> you know what happened? God gave me a sword. A small dagger. Sometimes when things don't go well, I pull it out and I said, God, I have a trumpet in my mouth. Fire comes out of my mouth, not smoke. And God, when I speak, dead things will come alive. I stab the devil because I have a prophetic word and it's sharp the more I use it. When I was 16, I had the worst youth service. I just became a youth pastor six months before that. My family went to Winko to do grocery shopping. It was at the time when my mom was the chauffeur. I decided to stay in the van. It was six months of being a youth pastor. And it was the, one of the worst youth services because we had about seven or eight youth. And these seven and eight youth were most of them my cousins. And I was trying to preach in English and my English was so horrible that I didn't even understand what I was saying. And they were making fun of me. And they were not just making fun of me, but one of my youth's relative came drunk and came to pick up the, his, his, his brother and he was sitting way on the back 
and he didn't speak English either but because he was drunk he didn't know that he didn't speak English so he was making fun of me as I was preaching so it turned from embarrassment to an utter shame and I remember my, my cousin Ilya was on the piano and I said Ilya could you lead us into the heavenlies and as he led us into the heavenlies I ran to the bathroom I asked God to make a hole right in the bathroom I said Lord hide me in here until the rapture and don't ever ever bring me back because I'm not going to those crazies and I'm done with ministry I'm 16 years of age six months into youth ministry the guy before me who was six months quit after six months and the guy before him after six months he quit so I'm the third guy six months as honey honeymoon period is over and I'm about to quit my parents go to Winko I'm already preparing my speech how I will tell my pastor that I'm quitting the youth ministry just like two guys before me I wouldn't have cell phones so I had to wait to get home to do that thing you know so I'm preparing a speech I'm crying because it's been a really really difficult day 16 years of age I'm looking at the winkle and God speaks to me and I'm not making this up that God speaks to me because at this time I really believe he did he said Vlad if you don't quit I will help you build a church that will be like winkle it will be huge it will be like a warehouse it will have bread on the shelves people will come in empty leave full they will come in sick they'll leave healed they'll come in broken they'll leave restored it will be open 24 hours there will be a 24-hour prayer and it's going to be a hub of revival for the whole world i'm 16 years of age who can't speak english to seven cousins and at the winkle who doesn't i don't have a cell phone and i just got my license but something happened at 16. god gave me a small dagger I never called the pastor and I never once decided to quit. I tried a few times. What I did is I went back to Winkle parking lot. I pulled my dagger and whatever was attacking me and saying ministry will never grow. I went like this. I said, God, you promised. Every prophetic word given to me by God is my dagger and I use it some of you you're leaving your sword at home and you're fighting the devil with your fist pull out a prophetic word given to you when you were young pull out a prophetic dream that given to you because what it does is this holy spirit hides in it when you cannot feel the holy ghost what it does is it opens your potential because God through the prophecy and through the dream reveals the potential of your inheritance what it does is it it, it terrifies the devil and it builds your faith today most of my prayer is stewarding prophetic words I try to spend a lot of time in my prayer praying through the promises of God praying through the prophetic words given to me you have them as well some of you the problem with you is this you're like well that's not a prophetic word you know it's just like three sentences it's just like two sentences I remember when we were at Kingdom Domain and Andres Bissoni he uh, prayed for me he prayed kind of for, for everybody and so he came up to me and he he's you know he's really tall and so he decided to hug me which is really nice there was only one problem he kind of was hugging me too long to the point where you know his prayer is like Lord let him meet Jesus and I was like Lord I will meet you if he doesn't let me go <laughs> he was like holding holding so tight and I was like Boo! and then when he released me he said something that it became a small prophetic word for me he says Holy Spirit told me to tell you he says you're his friend that's all he said when he said that I cannot tell you how many times I've prayed including today what I said Holy Spirit you said I'm your friend I use that it's a sharp blade I don't see what it does in spiritual world but my Bible says that the word from God meaning something that's revealed from God it's a sharp blade and in spiritual world it cuts through my limitations it cuts through the stagnation it cuts through my feelings it cuts through it and I get it to the new level in life can somebody say amen see some of you you have that I'm just gonna ask you one thing most of the time don't pray out of your problems pray out of your promises don't pray out of your struggles pray out of your prophetic words what God promised you pray through that you will see how you'll quickly cut through this season you will cut through that and you will go to the next season in life can somebody say amen you know last week I was in in Tennessee and the youth pastor director of some 60 churches a youth minister right before we went to church and we he kind of asked me for a lot of advice as we pray he says pastor Vlad he says I saw a dream last night 
and he describes to me a color of what I was wearing and he says I feel like God is saying that God's going to use you to pray for the politicians in the government of your state and in the government of your city he's a youth pastor he's younger than me he just asked me for advice in many things but when he said that I felt in my heart Holy Spirit gave me something to pray for now I don't pray Lord I want to minister to the politician I said Lord you said I'm going to minister to politicians I don't pray say Lord I, I want to be your friend I said Lord you said I am your friend I don't say Lord I want healings to happen I said Lord you said at the age of 16 that's how you got me into this Lord is because you promised and therefore I use that when you use that you're doing this in spiritual world you're cutting through the limitation and you're going to the new season hallelujah thank you for watching this content I hope this was a blessing to you if you're like me and you like to click on things click on this subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.